I think the the shock of going to juvie was enough, you know, losing my freedom and ability to move around. Like I'm, I'm quite hyperactive as you can probably feel, you know, I'm doing like 20, 30,000 steps a day, most days on the phone, you know, being locked in a cell was really hard for me. Uh, and I, I just really embellished that, you know, didn't want to think about that thought. Um, and you know, fear of going through withdrawals again, I think the withdrawals in juvie was so nasty and you know I couldn't walk I was sick I was throwing up you know I thought that I was dizzy I couldn't see straight I think you know that really had a, a long-lasting effect on me I didn't want to go through that again it starts with just taking that leap man you have to work hard you have to be incredibly smart do something that even if it fails even if it fails you are going to be proud of it doesn't matter how badly be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. <laughs> I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. Cool, I can hear you fine. Um, okay, uh, to start, can you... Uh, Say, can you get like like introduce yourself uh, with a few sentences about who you are and what you do? Um, that's a very open ended question to start. Um, I guess I'll start with my name. My, my name is Andrew Spira. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur uh, based in Sydney, Australia, uh, a very beautiful part of the world. Um, what am I doing right now? Currently, I, I've I'm involved in a, a very successful startup fintech business and uh, I'm on the road capital raising. Um, do you want me to give you some background? And this was, is this with Pineapple Funding and it's like the $10 million real estate por por portfolio? Yeah, so that's a separate company. Um, I started, I'll give you, I guess I'll give you my story. Um, I well, just start with I... like the like the like the blurb of of like what you're. you're what you're yeah, okay. So I'm a, a a fintech startup founder. Uh, I founded a very successful business called Pineapple Funding, uh, which made a lot of money, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, I was also I also am still a major real estate investor. Um, I've got over seven eight million dollars worth of property in Sydney. Uh, across 11 different properties, so it's quite diverse. Um, at the moment, um, I'm sort of branching out a little bit more. I've started buying properties overseas. I've got a bit of a fascination with that. Um, and I guess in my personal life, I, I love sport. I love walking. I love doing half marathons. Uh, I love going to the gym, and uh, I really like socializing as well. Cool, cool. So basically started... Uh, uh, a like a re real estate mini empire and are in the midst of expanding. Uh, but before you had this real estate empire, I kind of want to go back uh, to where things started. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like what growing up was like, um, uh, what, you know, living with your mom was like uh, and various partners that she had? Yeah, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> I assume you may be, done some background um yeah I, had a, I come from a pretty harsh upbringing uh, my parents got divorced when i was fairly young um when i was five years old i ended up living with my mom and she had an array of uh very um notorious and um colorful boyfriends that's how you describe it uh ended up uh moving over to my dad's place which was even what were they more of what a, were they like what was the uh she dated colorful, some, what do you mean? <laughs> uh she dated or she had a she went from billionaires to people fresh out of jail to uh, to people on the set the government benefits in australia it was, it was a uh, a very uh uh diverse range of uh boyfriends which my mom had when i was growing up why do you think that was uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe because of her upbringing. That's that's my gut feeling. So uh, I imagine that home life was pretty difficult. You said you went to your dad's. What happened there? Yeah, so home life was difficult. I won't go into too much detail, but I, I ended up actually getting taken off my mum and went over to my dad's place. And uh, that was even, I guess, worse. Uh, that was 
very harsh. Uh, ended up 15 running away from home, which was uh, difficult. And I, th- I was just quite a violent and abusive household and um, left home when I was 15. And uh, I guess that's where I sort of, I got my smarts from, you know, I had to really be street smart and work out how to make money and, and navigate the streets of Sydney and um, when ended up meeting a, after you left your your dad's um, I was couch surfing um, I was ended up friends from school yeah no it was friends from school I went to a private school it was friends that I'd met in similar circumstances to me that were also couch surfing so I sort of paired up with a couple of different guys and got fairly close to them and we'd sort of just stick together and you know we'd stick together and br- branch apart and um, we just did what we had to do. Yeah. When you say did what you had to do, like what, what was that? It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty, yeah. you know, it was, yeah. Yeah. It was messy. Yeah. What, it, like, was it like getting involved in like illegal kind of like underground business? Yeah, not really. Uh, more just desperation doing petty huh. desperation things. Quite kind of sad. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. Well, I think um, something, you know, like uh, we've told like a lot of stories about people that uh, went from very difficult circumstances to uh, to crime. Like we, we did a whole actually series on um, uh, ex-convicts. Uh, and I think something that's really inspirational about those stories is when you compare the lowest low, the, the points where desperation might have been highest and uh maybe moral checks and balances were uh somewhat ignored but then juxtapose that with you know the the places that you can rise to i think it gives a lot of hope to people that are anywhere on that scale right it's like you've kind of lived the depths of those depths but also reached those heights and i i i I think that's why i'm interested in exploring that um and if you're open to it instances you know when i when i was 17 i got into a bit of trouble um i sort of found myself on the street uh completely um i was addicted to methamphetamine uh, quite heavily and i had just run out of options i tried to stay everywhere hotels hospital couldn't work out how to do it anyway i ended up doing a, 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 a group of petty crimes across, around King's Cross in Sydney. Uh, yeah, the notorious King's Cross in Sydney. And I ended up getting the King Hit location. The, the, uh, it wasn't a King Hit location then. We're talking, we're talking 2015, 2016, around that period. So a few years before, it was the King Hit location. And I ended up getting caught. Um, and that was a, that was a weird feeling. Um, Oh, I was just doing petty, petty stuff, which I won't go into, just like shoplifting and stuff like that, which I ended up getting caught for. Um, they sent me to juvie and, um, you know, it was the first time. <laughs> it was, it was um, interesting, you know, because I was mainly around the eastern suburbs and King's Cross, so I didn't have m- many interactions with, you know, people from... You know, I'm sure I was dealing with people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but not people that are completely, um, you know, they were the very vulnerable people. It was my first time getting exposed to very vulnerable people, which is what jails and juvenile detention cent- centres are, are mainly made up of. And, you know, I was very sick when I went there. I was withdrawing from drugs. Uh, and, um, you know, the... Juvie's quite relaxed, you know, it was, they looked after me, they sort of, sort of got my medical um, sorted and I ended up going through my detox there and, you know, I ended up getting another chance and, you know, I wasn't convicted, I, it was just thrown out under the Children's Act, you know, it was never, yeah. there's no record of it. And um, But was there a, what, like coming out of Juvie, was there any thought of like, wow, like I am free of this now, like time to turn over a new leaf or was it still kind of you know scrap and 
and, and try to survive like any way you can. Like, what, like look, I'll, I'll go back a step. Though? During that period, I'd met a woman who's she's all over the paper with me. I won't say her name. Um, you know, she was 16 years older than me. She was the first, I guess, influential figure I had in my life. And um, I got close to her and, uh, you know, I did some time in juvie, uh, a couple of months or whatever it was. And um, I, I sort of got out. I was still bitter. I was really bitter. Uh, but, you know, we, my ex-partner and I, we got quite close and... I ended up moving in with her and she, she showed me how, to, sorry. I was just bitter about how desperate I got to. I felt like I didn't deserve to be uh, in that situation. I, I wish my parents had cared a bit more. So I was still quite bitter, um, which was, look, it's challenging. You know, I think those, that period between 16 and 18 has actually shaped my whole life. You know, that's why I'm, I work so hard. That's why I, um, you know, put in the 16 hour days. That's why I call, you know, I, I never give up on stuff. And, um, you know, I, I work out of desperation. I think that's been really why I've been so successful. You know, I worked out, first of all, how to make money, uh, which is through this, you know, I've sort of mastered this unsecured business loans, all the property stuff, you know, I, I lose money out of property. I'm no good with that. I've sort of mastered my craft. And, um, you know, I just haven't stopped working, you know, I'm, I'm at the point now where during a period last year, I lost everything and I got down to about 10 grand because my um, assets got tied up with my ex-partner. Yeah, so talking about the, the that, that ex-partner, you said like when you got out of juvie, she was one of the first real um, people in your life that offered you maybe a little bit of direction. Like what what was the direction that you feel like she, she gave you or at least support? Yeah, well, you, you'd be surprised. Just knowing that someone's there is sometimes all the support you need. You don't actually need their support, uh, which is what I, I'm coming to realize. Like, you, could, you, could, you can kind of do everything yourself. You have to. You always have to do everything yourself. But just knowing someone's there is uh, invaluable. And I think she provided that, that comfort to me to, you know, for me to be able to be, a, you know, an unruly teen to, you know, getting a job, starting my own business off the back of that job and... Um, I guess really powering forward with my life but you know there was still this bitterness and resentment um, I managed to re you know get a job after the juvie period obviously that was, was good um, the business I got a job at went out of business so I, off the back of that I started my own business in the same industry uh, I started, that's I really funny a, it's, it's yeah. often like my yeah. first <laughs> entrepreneurial endeavor was yeah. I got laid off and I'm like I could do whatever they're doing better and I feel like that's like often like uh, a recurring story of like you get a little bit of a taste of an industry, they lay you off, and then if you're if you have that entrepreneurial spark, you can you can run with the information. So like, what what was the first business that you made? Yeah, okay. So I got a job at a um, unsecured business loan lender in Bono Junction. Uh, so short term business loans, um, you know, higher interest in the banks, higher fees, but higher risk. So um, I got, <laughs> yeah. no, no, it's, it's non-bank lender, non-bank lender. So in Australia, we have this, uh, issue at the moment where the banks seem to not want to lend to small and medium sized businesses. So off the back of that, I guess for the last seven or eight years, there's been a lot of non-bank lenders that have come out and are doing private, private lending with businesses. So, you know, a bank might typically charge 14, 15% for a commercial business loan, you know, your unsecured business loan lenders will be at 18, 19, 20%. So it's not loan shark and they're, and they're relevant to the market. Yeah. It, it was great. <laughs> I was, I, I like the, the, all the, doing all the selling gave me a bit of a buzz. So, you know, when, when it went out of business, I, I was really upset, you know, I, I got a bit depressed and whatever. And, you know, the founder of that business, he went and started his own, another one, like he raised my, I don't know how he did it. He's doing really well now, surprisingly. He's a, he's a hustler. Uh, he went out and started his own, another one. He raised $40 million off these Melbourne guys. Anyway, I messaged him on a Sunday morning. I said, oh, can you, can you give me a job there? And he said, no way. <laughs> I said, all right, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the next day, I, start, I registered my company 
uh, and I started hitting, you know, I, I had a job, another job in for a SaaS company and I, I started hitting the phones. So I'd go to the SaaS company from eight till five and then I started off just dialing Western Australia numbers because they were three hours behind and brokering them. Yeah, after work. So that's how Pineapple Funding was born. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. It was it was with a lender. I won't say the lender's name, but he, the the founder and his son have become really good friends of mine now. Um, during this difficult period, um, it was a fifty thousand dollar deal. Uh, it was a, a restaurant in uh, Perth, Western Australia, and you know I was. I remember I was on the train coming back from that that job, that bloody job in wherever it was, and going back to the city and uh i remember you know the deal's being funded i was like fist pumping there people were looking at me <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so it was good it was a good feeling that's awesome i mean it, it seems yeah. like you had the sales skill to really uh make it your own and like take what you learned from that initial company and turn it into something that could have like some legs so um how did that business develop from that first sale and then also like how did your 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 life and like battle with like substance abuse um uh change from like getting out of juvie was it was it still was it hard to keep on the straight and narrow no it was, it was a hard no after that i wouldn't even you know if i was a i went so straight that if I, there was an event with alcohol at it i wouldn't go and people would know that even in my industry, you know, I'm in finance, you know, alcohol yeah. and socializing is huge, uh, huge. And uh, I just wouldn't go, I wouldn't show up. Pe people knew, uh, I told them, I, uh, you know, ex uh, alcoholic and addict and I just can't be around it. Um, so yeah, I, I got from 2016 to 2022 clean. So just under six years clean, five and a half years. Uh, no alcohol, no nothing. After you know, spending fifteen to eighteen abusing substances, Which is such like a formative time. I think it, it, yeah, it, it can make it that much harder to quit. Like what what were what were the things that you think allowed you to keep that sobriety for six years? Um, I think the. The shock of going to juvie was enough, you know, losing my freedom and ability to move around. Like I'm, I'm quite hyperactive as you can probably feel, you know, I'm doing like 20, 30,000 steps a day, most days on the phone, you know, being locked in a cell was really hard for me. Uh, and I, I just really embellished that, you know, didn't want to think about that thought. Um, and you know, fear of going through withdrawals again, I think the withdrawals in juvie were so nasty and you know I couldn't walk I was sick I was throwing up you know I thought that I was dizzy I couldn't see straight I think you know that really had a a long lasting effect on me that I didn't want to go through that again and so you kept on the straight and narrow I imagine work was uh, also helpful in just dedicating yourself to something um, uh, that was growing and exciting uh, what mm. what did the growth of of the company look like? What were some like milestones, financial or otherwise, that oh, look, uh, were exciting to you? I'm pretty open. We started off first year. I did sixty thousand. You know, the second year I, I worked out how to. I went to India. Sixty thousand in like you made sixty thousand dollars. I made sixty thousand. Yeah, Australian dollars for brokering. Was that loans. like like I want to focus a little bit on that? Like, were you yeah. like? hyped because that's like sixty thousand made in your first year as like a young guy like like making i was it 19 i was 18 turning 19 i think i just turned 19 and um you know i'm withdrawing the cash out of the atm running around you know like an idiot so uh no it's good you know i was i was hyped and then you know i was like okay well how can i develop this uh let's set up a call center so i went over to india I had a contact there. I spent four weeks in Calcutta, which if anyone knows is, is a hectic place. Uh, I was 19, I was going around on buggies, first time overseas, um, set that up. We went up to 500,000 revenue. Then I'm like, all right. Wow, the second year. The second year. Wow, wow, and yeah. what were your operational costs on that? Um, it was about 45% EBIT, so okay. yeah. Yeah, we did about one point two million turnover, really, really five hundred thousand profit. Yeah, it's really good. Wait, five hundred thousand profit? Yeah. Wow. 
huge. Yeah. That th- going from 60,000 to 500,000 must have been insane, but I also imagine that's a lot for a 20-year-old to even think about having. Like I can imagine if I was making that kind of money when mm-hmm. I was like 20, I feel like yeah, it it could have uh it could have gotten me into trouble. Did you like? Yeah, how well, did you like not spend it? It, it on didn't. The wrong it thing? didn't. Yeah, no, no. Because I was obsessed. Like I am all in. I was like buying every weekend. I was out looking at properties and what I was going to buy. And yeah, all my weekends would be about was investing. Because obviously, I, I don't spend much. Or I didn't spend. I spend a lot now because I'm older and I don't care. Like I just want to have a good time at the moment. But um, back then, I didn't spend a cent. I was budgeting and I was you know working out how I was going to buy this property and how I was going to do this and trying this investment. But, you know, I shouldn't have been, you know, on hindsight and what I've learned from losing my initial pool of wealth and now having to rebuild is I should have just put all the money back into my business. You know, I was trying to diversify. um, But diversifying into places that you didn't really understand. Like, it's like the classic thing is like buy property, but it's also much more complex than just buying like houses and stuff, right? it's much more complex and it's not suitable for everyone, especially someone who can generate income like I can, or I'm not saying that arrogantly, you know, I don't have the patience for property, you know, you know, and a property is great for some people, but for someone like me, and I know a lot of people in my industry can speak to this property is just not for us. You know, it's just not, it's not a good investment for people like me. Um, and, And then, you know, friends reached out to me and, needed 500,000 for this. And, uh, you know, I put money in and, you know, it's gone. Like I got ripped off a couple of times, which is quite bad. Um, you know, yeah, cause I was you, overly trusting. Did you, um, what are your thoughts on like talking about how much you're making when you were do like, cause you are making like half a million dollars when you're yeah. 20 and probably not being shy or too shy about, that or were you were like did you not tell anyone like i like well, were you tight-lipped with it or were you like telling all your buddies like i'm making this amount like if you need anything i got you like it's, I, I imagine it's hard a hard secret to keep well i didn't have the social skills at the time so you know i, I was working from behind a computer i was making all my money online which i still do to this day like you know some days i'm remitting like half a million dollars worth of payments in a you know, in a funny town in the Philippines or a first class Emirates somewhere. Anyway, um, I didn't, talk, what I'm leading back to is I didn't talk to anyone. And then when I'd see an old friend, I'd get really excited and tell them everything. And that's, that's what got me into trouble. Yeah. Basically, and I didn't realize like I was being, doing it. Well, I imagine it's hard. Cause it's like, you're, yeah. you're excited about all this stuff that's happening. Yeah. And then I think in a way when you're too excited and you say too much, it kind of, paints paints a little bit of a target on your back for either friends who might need help or like i don't know on undercurrents of jealousies or now it's like hey like the tab's always on you andrew like you know yeah. stuff like that yeah well the tab was always on me every time i take <laughs> someone out which i was okay with um you know it was more just over you know i've learned this now and i'm glad i've learned it at this age but boy it's been a painful lesson I was over trusting with people, you know, I, I didn't, I thought, you know, I, I see the best in everyone. Like, and that, that's what everyone's telling me. Like, you've just got to stop being so over trusting and, uh, you know, trying to save everyone. I guess that's just my heart. And, you know, that's what I, you know, I had a really tough time, particularly in those two years. I've, I've had a tough time in the last couple of years too. And, you know, I'm still like, I, when I see someone, you know, with any type of pain or, anything I, I want to help them and that i'd like yeah. you know i've got to i've got to stop doing that because i'm not helping myself yeah so uh you also launched pineapple funding in the uk too yeah yeah so we're in new zealand in the uk as well so what would it what did it look like to expand internationally because you went from sixty thousand to five hundred thousand, and now you're expanding internationally you have the call centers in india what does your operation look like in like 2021 2022 <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, you know, I was one of those guys that got rich during COVID. In those three years, I made about 15 million in profit, which is how wow. I was able to acquire all these assets. Yeah, and live that profit. lifestyle, which the media love to talk about. What, <laughs> yeah. what does that feel like? 
to go from um, basically like you were kind of like po- basically in poverty to making <laughs> fifteen million dollars. Like, like is that did you did it feel did it feel amazing? Did it feel no different? Like, like what what are the what are the feelings surrounding making that kind of money and exploring the world at that age? It was enormously stressful. Uh, it wasn't enjoyable at all. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was buying property sporadically. I was investing. Um, you know, I sort of lost focus on my business a little bit. And, you know, j- at the back end of, you know, I'll talk you through it. You know, I started buying cars. I bought a house in Vaucluse. Uh, I started buying watches. I think at one stage I had like 11 Rolexes and Which two Which apparently is a very and- good store of value. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I've Not... heard Rolexes have increased in price like 15% a year or something crazy like that. Again, if you understand the market, I'm sure it's a great store of value. But, you know, if you're someone who's making money elsewhere, don't don't buy Rolexes or, you know, APs or Pateks yeah. for the money. Just focus on your business. That's what I've learned. Focus on what you're good at. Um, you know, and, you know, I had everything and, I got comfortable and I, I didn't have to work so much. I automated parts of the business and um, going on holidays with my ex-partner, spending 300 grand in Monaco and- uh, 300 you know, grand? Yeah, yeah, one holiday, yeah. It's just absurd. And I thought, you know, you think nothing can go wrong. And, you know, I started, again, drugs slowly started creeping back into my life and that's when everything started to go wrong. You know, like- what um. What, what when you say drugs started creeping back in like in what ways well i, I wasn't coping with the stress of having the money uh what do you and, mean stress of having the money because it seems like yeah you like were, I, you said you were delegating things away yeah? i was delegating it but it was enormous responsibility and I, I always you know i kind of i guess i stagnated um and i was you know i wanted to I thought diversifying, you know, this is a particular story to me. I'm not saying it's for everyone. I thought diversifying was the way to go. You know, I was ripping money out and trying, putting money everywhere and properties. I invested in a public company. Like I put like 400 grand in this public company, which crashed. Um, I put 200 grand with a mate. Um, it was a female. She lost all the money. Um, yeah. It's like it was, I diversified. You know, I started buying properties and losing money on those. You know, there's a period of time Why where I lost the money on the properties. Um, I was buying, looking for a short term win, um, and I ended up. You were you know, looking to hold this, on to the properties. My partner and I split during the period. During the period, and everything got frozen. <laughs> so, it was just a run of you know, everything going wrong at once. And, you know, I was too comfortable and um, I started using and wasn't, didn't have that consequential thinking. And, you know, I I ended up losing pretty much everything, you know, by the time, while everything was frozen and, you know, my business started, you know, stop focusing on my business. And, uh, you know, I ended up having a bad reaction to, uh, I was doing coke for a few days straight and, you know, I had one of those reactions where, you know, I'd been up for four or five days and I thought people were coming in through the, the walls and uh, I thought people, you know, were after me when they weren't. And I, yeah. I ended up, you know, taking a, a private jet trip with a, a fake passport when I had my real passport because I thought people were after me and, you know, a gun and whatever and ended up spending four months in jail with, you know, a wow. business with 2,200 customers. So, um yeah, it wow. was it was an interesting experience. Um, everything kind of went wrong for me at once. Uh, did it did it feel because it was like the partner what like you you were kind of fo- focusing less on the business than your partner and you split assets frozen. Then it's like because of all that happening, like probably under stress. So then you start using, which makes it worse. And then it's like kind of spirals from there. Is it like, like, I'm, I'm curious, um, is there anything that you think you could have done to stop the spiral? Or do you feel like you just kind of have to hit that rock bottom moment to find your way back up? Like, like how, what, like uh, if you were looking back in time, like how, what would you have done differently? 
Look, the spiral was so bad. Uh, I started using benzodiazepines again in 2022, recreationally, because uh, I was just bored. I was making money yeah. and I Those didn't know what to benzos, do. Right? Like, yeah, like, benzos, right? Yeah, I didn't think about... Yeah, like Valium. I didn't think about scaling up my business. I thought I'd invest and everything would be all right. And, you know, everything just goes out the window when you're on drugs. All sensible, consequential, logical thinking goes out the window. And, you know, I started using benzos and... You know, then I started drinking and I started doing coke and, you know, everything else sees back in your life. And slowly things just start spiraling. You're not thinking properly. Um, you know, the business just goes out the window or any, you know, any sort of drive for the business goes out the window. And, you know, all of a sudden I went from doing like 7 million turnover with like 3 million profit to like making a million bucks a year with like 200 grand profit, you know, like that's wow. how much I went down. And I had all these expenses, everything was done incorrectly the first time. Like, you know, I was, I was using the bank's money to buy property and heavily leveraging myself. I shouldn't have been doing that. Um, so you were uh, over leveraged. And, I was over leveraged. And yeah. your company wasn't like built in a way that you could sustainably like take a step back over how long did things go from like that, you know, three million profit to like now like two hundred thousand like how long it went from later? within a year of me take starting to take drugs again that happened yeah wow. and it was like a slow spiral it was uh, it was wow. like unbelievable uh, and, and you know not only that i had this new lifestyle now which i had to try and maintain and you know my ex-partner she was obsessed with her image and um you know that we had and to try like, and maintain that it, too yeah it's when you have yeah. it it's so hard to get yeah. out yeah yeah that's it the lifestyle creep, dude. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Like we, we we moved into uh, a new house. Um, cause I, I have a couple other like media businesses, um, mm. and the team moved into a new house. And like, it, we moved into it for the studio and all these things. But something I've been talking to a lot of friends about is just like, how do you ensure that you don't let the lifestyle creep get too far? Because like that's what leads to the unhappiness. It's like your like once you make money your lifestyle just matches the money that you make and then you're constantly just in the, the, the wheel of, uh, of, of chasing more and more. Um, do you like, like, did you, w when did you realize you actually had to like downsize? No, I never had to downsize. I just had to you never had to downsize even when you were making 200 K. Uh, I just profit? had, well, I still had a lot of savings. I had a lot of built up cash. I sort of, just everything went wrong but i just managed to wriggle out of the hole like just like things okay, were so, so tight and i sort of restarted the business and now i'm sort of you know like it was like i think i had like nine thousand dollars and a ninety thousand dollar legal bill at one point and you know like <laughs> you know i just had to work my way out of it like i, so I was this close i was this I close from not being able to working. get back up that close so i want to talk about that because yeah where we left off where we left our hero last he was in jail for four yeah. months because yeah. of like a coke induced psychosis <laughs> yeah. um of pe people coming through the walls trying yeah. to take a private jet away from the country so yeah. where where was the jail where were you well we're going sydney dubai sorry sydney dubai via darwin the jet cost me 600 grand, completely 600,000 Australian dollars, completely unnecessary. $600,000 uh, yeah. for the flight? Anyway. <laughs> oh we, my, you can buy yeah. a small jet for $600,000. I know. I, know. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't shit. be laughing, but it's embarrassing. It's the first time I've spoken about it. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you, you paid someone six hundred thousand dollars for a one-way flight to another country yes, yes. was it, it a that plane has to be sick though it was a gulf stream yeah okay, okay. Yeah. so it was like do they have caviar like why, why is it six hundred? yeah they got everything drink champagne steak whatever yeah. food you want air host you'd be surprised private jet travel it's very expensive on a gulf stream you're looking at you know like 15 to twenty thousand an hour just for the fuel Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So a fifteen-hour flight, you're looking Whoa. at like three, four hundred grand just for the fuel. Then you've got the airport permit costs. The private jet brokers operate on the the smell of an oily rag. Like five, ten percent they make. You know, the the operator would have made like fifty grand off that or forty grand. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so so yeah. how do you get caught? Uh, 
mate, the f- passport I used was, I had my real passport, but I used the fake one, and it was so obvious, like, it was such a, like, I bought it on the internet, and it had been shipped, and, uh, you know, I just on a website I found, and it, it, somehow it got to me, I don't know how, and, you know, it was so bad, uh, they just picked me up in, when I got to the next capital city, I, I think they knew in Sydney that it was fake, but I think they let it go on for so long, just to, you know, see if that led to anything else, which it didn't, you know, to see like what I was about or if I was oh, up to like, anything. Oh, like, is he like They let it go a little some bit. kind of narcotics Yeah, 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 yeah. They let it go to Darwin. Yeah. But that was the worst thing, you know, I ended up in a, a, a jail in the Northern Territory with, it was all uh, Indigenous Australians. So no one spoke English. You know, there was people in there for like spearing, spearing each other and crossbowing each other. Like it was a, like a tribal jail. It was... It was horrendous. It was a wake up call, yeah. And also, Northern Australia—that's like super hot, like all the time, right? Fifty degrees every day, no aircon, no fan, spiders oh. everywhere, dirty oh. mate, not looked after. The yeah, Northern Australia, Northern Territory, justice needs. Oh. Everyone knows it needs some work. I, I experienced it firsthand. It was bad. God. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So you're in this jail. Are, like, what are you thinking in the jail? Like, like what, what, what is occupying your days and your mind as you're in this, this, this prison in 50, also 50 degrees is like 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, which is j- just, just for the, the American translation. Um, uh, it, 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 it's super hot. Uh, but yeah, what, what's taking up your, your time? Yeah, so the first, I had to detox because obviously I'd been partying for a year every day. So yeah. detox is brutal, you know, not not like when I was younger. I spent seven days in like a detox part of the prison and then I moved down to the segregation part, which, you know, 50% of the jail up there is in segregation because of short staffing. Um, and when I was there, the conditions are just so... You wouldn't even believe this was Australia. Like they were just so short staffed. Um they just keep you in your cells day after day. You know, for the first two weeks, I think we got out once for one hour. Um, wow. And, you know, there's people living like that for years, which is really sad. Um, I spent four weeks in the, the first segregation part. Uh, I had a cellmate. The first bloke didn't speak a word of English, which, you know, I thought, oh, my God, I'm, he's kind of like, I'm going to die. Uh, you know, luckily, you know, the elders were like, he's right, which is like, he's OK. Like, leave him alone. Um, they established pretty quickly, like I was of no threat. I wasn't from Northern Territory. Uh, I had no family. I had no one putting any money in my account. Um, and they established that really quickly. So, you know, quickly I was looked after. Um, I spent three or four weeks in there. Um, very boring. No one spoke English and very hot. Uh, I'd never been in that type of heat before either. What, what Uh, language are they speaking? Like what's the Aboriginal language? It's called Creole, uh, Creole. Yeah, it's it's broken English, so you can pick up some words, uh, but very hard. It's very fast and hard to understand. Yeah, did yeah. you learn any while you were there? Uh, just the bad words, mate. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Sad. you're you're in the prison. You can't really talk to anyone. It's super boring. Are you like planning your? Uh, there's there's this uh, uh, there's this book. Um, blanking on the name about the guy that went to like the nazi prison um and he wait what i'm gonna ask chat gpt wait what's the book where the guy goes to the nazi prison and he's a psychologist um but he goes into this prison and uh, it's called man's search for meaning and basically like the whole time he's there he's working uh on his 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 thesis about like finding meaning in desperate situations and just writing any like things on walls and scraps of paper like were you doing anything to occupy your mind like thinking how are you going to get out of this like crap situation that you're in once you're out yeah look i didn't realize what was coming when i got out firstly i didn't realize i didn't know how long i'd be in there for because you know i couldn't get the shortage of phones shortage of letters like the conditions in that jail are uh you know, something you'd expect in Southeast Asia, you know, not, not in Australia. It's the horrendous conditions, um, which I won't speak to too much because I think it's a political issue at the moment in Australia. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I sort of, I got to the next section, which is, you, you know, you get out three or four days a week and you're, you know, out for most of the day, which is called Sector 6 there. And, 
you know, I started working, like I, I started being a, a yard helper and sort of had my own business. I had the, the Tongan guys uh, doing a barber shop uh with the so wait, you started your own business in the midst <laughs> yeah, yeah, of getting yeah. out of jail and kind of being yeah. in jail i didn't know i was going to get out i thought i was going to be there i didn't know how it all worked because i couldn't get on the phone or get a lawyer yeah. so i thought screw it i'm just gonna keep my mind occupied i applied to be a yard worker started working started my own barber school and then at night you know i'd start i did a business school with the people in my block um, so I teach people how to, you know, just people don't even know how to rent, apply for a rental property. You know, they're, they're so disadvantaged. They wouldn't, you know, starting a business or getting a job is just, you know, they, they don't even think that's possible, but yeah. you know, everyone in there, Oh, what do you want to be when you get out? I want to be a drug dealer, but they don't realize, you know, the three, 400 bucks a week they can make being a drug dealer, you know, they can go get a, a laborer job and make three or four grand a week. And, you know, that's what I taught people in there. Yeah. Um, and I thought I, I owed. I owed it to them, um, considering, you know, I'd gone from, you know, that period when I was a teenager to, uh, you know, being able to be a regular member of society and have a job and have a business and, you know, not live the American dream, but partially live the Australian dream for yeah. a period of time. Um, and, you know, I ended up, you know, the, the case kind of diffused because they sort of realized the AFP, the federal police, you know, because it was at an airport, it was AFP level. Uh, meaning the federal police were prosecuting the case. They kind of realized that there was nothing to it than a bender, you know, and they deal with serious stuff. So they sort of just gave up on it and I yeah. ended up going, getting out. It's not like you're and... going to a different country, like you're go going back home, like you're an Australian <laughs> yeah. citizen. It used a fake passport yeah. for that. So it wasn't like it was anything terrible, terrible. Yeah, embarrassing. And um, I got out and, and the, the, the moment of, you know, you think everything's going to be okay, and then I got out, you know, and I had so many problems. Like, I, you couldn't believe it. You know, like, no one was answering my phone. No one wanted to work with me. Um, Why not? Because of all the negative media that happened after this really? event. Really? Was there media? A lot. Why? Because of the story, you know. I got caught with two girls on a private jet. Trying to flee the Wait, country. What, yeah. what, what was the story? What was the headline? Because I know, like, I, the Australian tabloids could be kind of brutal. Uh, it's brutal. I, I haven't looked at it in a while. Let's have a look. What is it like? Playboy millionaire tries to yeah, flee country nah. on private yeah, jet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Multi millionaire this, uh, multi millionaire that. And, you know, they, they don't realize there's a person behind that. They just, they hammered yeah. me. Mm. Yeah. Why did yeah, that, that, that feel for you? Yeah, it's killed me. Like it just, a loss of social status is real. I had to reinvent myself, uh, get new friends, get new uh, people to work with. And, you know, now I'm about a year on. Uh, I'm a year on next week. Um, I got out on the third year of from August. that moment, from getting from getting out of, uh, out of yeah. jail and all that. Yeah, man, I had no choice. Like the I, when I realized that because of all the money I'd spent and moved everywhere during that event, um, I got out with nine thousand dollars, and I, I I just got straight back to work because that's the only like I, I literally got out on the Thursday and I was working again on the Monday. So uh, it, it was like literally I knew if I did not get back to work that next week, I was going to end up on government benefits in Australia. So I just got back to work. Wow you know, hustled, kept hustling, even though people were saying no to me and wouldn't work with me. And uh, I had issues you wouldn't even believe. Um, you what know, were just your being friends a, saying? A, everyone just abandoned that I was dealing with before that. Yeah, like I've got all new said, friends like we now. Don't wanna, we don't like, want to deal like with Were you. your old friends, were your old friends were just like, hey, like, like, like you, they wouldn't even pick up your calls? Nothing. Wow. That would suck. Sucked. Fuck. So. How did you not like get despondent? I still had the I had the fight in me. I, I don't think I could do it again. Like I, I how old are you right now? You're like twenty twenty five. I'm twenty six in a month. I'm twenty five. Fuck, dude, you've lived like a <laughs> like a full forty years. <laughs> twenty five years. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't think I could do it again. I, I like maybe I could do it again. I'm not gonna do it again, obviously. But um, it was hard. You know, there were some days where, you know, just so many things were going wrong. Like I remember, like 
ah, uh, like the tax office, you know, you just, all of a sudden when you get all this negative media, you just become the easiest target. So I had to like fix up, I fixed up everything from like credit card debts to mortgages to divorce settlement. Like I just dealt with it one thing at a time. Um, and now things are pretty, you know, I'm back to it. You know, it's tough. Like I'm in a hyper growth stage in a fintech, but you know, I'm dealing with good problems. Like what are we going to do for, with this million or yeah, that million? Better or, than the other gonna, problems. Yeah, yeah, better than the other problems. Did you uh, think about changing your name? Yeah, I did. I went to the, I went to the, I went to the um, RMS with the name change and I had an error on the form and I had to go and get my, another copy of my birth certificate. I, I was that close to changing and my like, name. That close. So can, can you, so, so like you were about to do it and then it, uh, it like, it like went to crap. And so now like 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 you're just like all right you know what i'm just gonna i'm gonna stick with it it's fine and you know what now no one cares like I, i've got it got investors coming in clients don't care like it's sort of um it's like water you know, people under the bridge. yeah people that care are the people i, I wouldn't want to really work with anyway you know they're not my yeah. cup of tea you know most of the you know i'm working with a lot more high net worth now it's it's you know it's been the worst thing that's ever happened to me because it's made me more detached from part of society but you know a lot more particularly business people can relate to what i went through you know the the most common one i get is oh i've done worse than that i just didn't get caught you know that's what everyone yeah. <laughs> you know i've heard that like 50 times in the last couple yeah, of months dude. particularly yeah <laughs> i can I, I i i can imagine i can imagine and like you know like i think it's uh i think also the more distance you have because like this was fairly recent this was like you know like a, like a year ago that you went through all this so it's like i i feel like the more distance that you put between that you know that that thing in terms of time uh and like the consistency with which you are like focusing on your business focusing on like helping others focusing on on helping and developing yourself like you'll i think you'll get that societal uh love again uh it just takes i think it takes time it's like the robert downey jr effect like people want to give mm -hmm. like everyone a second chance and uh it just takes i think it it takes time and it seems like you're already seeing the 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 fruits of of putting in good time into to reinventing uh yourself and and doubling down on the things that are, that are most important yeah, and now I'm a big believer in the universe and what you can create. And, um, you know, I'm still learning how to create, but I'm sort of, yeah. you know, I know how to create now, which is, is good. And um, I, I'm learning about the power of the universe and power of the universe and, you know, doing the right thing and how it brings all these, all these positive. Uh, have you read The Power uh, of Now? Yeah, positive people into your life. Yeah, The Power of Now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you read that book? I haven't read it, but everyone tells me to read it. It's a, it's a solid book. I think, I think you would like Man's Search for Meaning, which is the one that I mentioned before, and Power of Now is pretty good if you're, you're a universe guy. Um, so where is everything today? Like, like where are things standing? You mentioned the fintech company. Like, what's the fintech company? What are you guys doing? Like, what, w like where are things standing at this moment? Um, things, are, things are good. Um, I'm sort of, I'll speak to me personally. Um, I've sort of, you know, all the money I was making before I was investing. Now, all the money I, I've promised myself, you know, when everything finalized last year, that all the money I make is going to be put into, you know, lifestyle because I didn't do that before. Um, so I've lifestyle, sort of started tra mean? like I'm traveling, you know, I'm forcing myself to travel. You know, I'm very introverted, but it doesn't seem like it, but by, by heart I am. And, um, you know, I'm, tra I'm traveling all over. I've been traveling over Asia for two months and. Um, I guess exploring the world a bit and living in different destinations. And um, I think, you know, goals for me in the next couple of years, I'd, I'd like to buy another place in Sydney, um, a house uh, around the same area I lived in before. And, um, you know, one of my big goals is to start a family um, because yeah. I want to sort of create the next generation now. Um, I think that's, that's, that's become even more important to me after Darwin because, you know, that was the biggest thing yeah, I could think about like, I, I, what if I spent a couple of years here and I, I, you know, everyone in there was so excited for their kids to visit them. And I, you know, I sort of felt like I was missing out. So that's had yeah. a, that's had a big impact on me post getting yeah. out. Mm. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And especially like, you know, with, 
so, like so much instability in, in your home life like you, know, you can build a like a really tight-knit family for yourself and I think that's mm. that's like some beautiful stability that you could introduce into your life um, so yeah. what are you most excited for in in the future like uh, um, like specifically with with the business is it just the traveling well, portion or is look it I, I've started a, a charity uh, well not a charity I, 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 I give, I'm giving back um, the big thing for me, even before last year happened and I had all the media, I, I have a lot of people that ask for help about addiction and ask for, um, you know, even just, you know, a, a phone call. You know, some people yeah. just want a phone call or my number or WhatsApp. I mean, they, people get me through Facebook. I don't really use it, but, you know, a lot of people ask for help through there. Uh, so I've started a bit of a, I guess you call it a foundation. It's not really a foundation. I'm just helping people. Um, which is more one-on-one -on -one counseling for uh, disadvantaged and advantaged people that have uh, got st um, stuck in that cycle of addiction. And, you know, why I think I'm excited about it is because I've, I think I've experienced the highs and lows and I, I haven't completely, you know, I haven't completely ruined myself. You know, if I do it again, I'm sure I will. And, you know, I think I've got a lot to give and uh, I've got a lot of experience in, in different situations now. And, um, I'd really like to grow this foundation so that, you know, it's, it's global and, um, I can help people stuck in that cycle of addiction, yeah. um, from all parts of the world. So looking back at your story and everything that we've covered, what advice do you think you would give yourself when you were first starting out? Like, like maybe when you were, you made your first sale for your first business, even before your first 60 K that you made, um, what advice do you think you would give that person starting out? enjoy it I, I didn't enjoy it now 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 i'm enjoying it and it's just so much better like i i, I didn't enjoy the ride before you got to enjoy the ride you know yeah. <laughs> like it's fun we uh, you know i don't do this for the money or uh, start all these businesses or buy properties not for the money it, it's to have fun you know it's the you know it, it's good fun you know starting all these business, businesses and it gives you a sense of purpose so i wish i enjoyed it a bit more i feel like i I wasted three or four years not enjoying working so hard. Uh, and that's one thing I now, like I, I enjoy every day. I enjoy every meeting, you know, I enjoy everything I do. So uh, I make sure that I enjoy it. Mm. Sweet. I think that's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much for coming on, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our audio editing team lead is Ashley Jimenez with support from Jessica Morales, Miley Lipton, Si Pan, Kenny Wright, Josie Yo, Matt Fernandez, and Merritt Hill. Our outreach and research team lead is Desiree Nunez with support from Marissa Granados, Monica Lee. Sarah Tiersma. And Yao Luo. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.